years ago, the Sentinel Group released a documentary video entitled Transformations. It highlighted the wonderful work of God in four distinct communities, communities whose only common attributes were dysfunction and despair. The video's reception around the world was both remarkable and gratifying. In thousands of cities, it stimulated a new hunger for prayer and unity. A few viewers, however, stumbled over the word transformation. They wondered how transformation could be claimed in places where social blemishes remain. But transformation is not synonymous with perfection. In this present fallen world, there are no perfect communities. Transformation is more accurately related to sanctification. It is both a state and a process. How we define a community depends on our perspective. Is the proverbial glass half full or half empty? I believe a community's distance from perfection is less important than the distance it has migrated from its former state. Community transformation is not about great meetings or even church growth. It is about the gospel making a tangible impact on society as a whole. How long the condition lasts depends on the individual community. Our ministry here at the Sentinel Group is to sow seeds of hope, to inspire confidence in God, to create a greater appetite for His presence. And I trust this coming presentation will do just that. Dominion and all belong to God. He establishes order in the heights of heaven. Can his forces be numbered? Upon whom does his light not rise? What is man that you are mindful of him? His name was Angotorzor. This happened a long time ago. It is not written. My grandfather told me under the stars. His name was Angwatizwak. He was the spiritual leader of our clan. He helped our people, the Inuit, form their thoughts. He told us when it was time to break camp and move on. We lived on the northern shore of the big island, the one the Anglos call Baffin. When Angwatizwak was getting to have hair like snow, he heard about God from an Inuk who had come up from the south. The Inuk spoke of a new belief of someone named Jisuzi. He said he was the son of God. At first, Angwatizwak did not understand what he heard, but he was curious, for his job was to explain spiritual mysteries to the people. And that is when the hidden things began to move inside himself. A vision came to him. He went on a long journey to search for truth. For a long time, he could find nothing. But one day, he found a place where the light and the dark came together. He could not go into the light or into the dark. So he climbed into a gap between them. He went up and up and up until he found a door. But he could not get in. And so he awoke from his dream. Angwatizwa could not understand this. He thought maybe the door would open if he followed the Inuk's god. A desire was burning inside him. 
And so he decided to give himself to this new faith. There is an Inuit way. When the people want to give their whole heart into something, they make a ritual. So Angwatizwak thought he would kill a seal so that the people might share its meat and its blood together. That is when he told his people, I've made a choice. I'm going to go out to hunt seal. If I catch one tonight, I'm going to give my life, and I'm going to practice this ritual. But if I don't catch anything, I'm not going to do it. There was no moon, no stars that night, just heavy clouds. So Angwatizwak knew it would be hard to find Seal, but he wanted to do it. So he went out onto the frozen ocean to look for a breathing hole. Even in the dark, he found one, but the Seal was not there. He had to wait. It was very cold. So he built a little wall of ice to protect from the wind. Then he sat down and made his harpoon ready to strike the seal. When after some time the seal didn't come, he fell asleep. While Angwatizwak was sleeping, the dream came again. He saw it until one time his head became heavy and he woke up. When he opened his eyes, he looked down at the breathing hole there was something different. He realized he could see his shadow. Something very strange on a moonless winter night. Suddenly the area began to get brighter and brighter. And that was when he saw them. And Guatizwak saw three beings that looked like they had wings. Wings! They were coming down from out of the clouds. They did not speak. But Angwatizwak knew why they had come. As soon as they left, a seal came out of the hole. Angwatizwak put the harpoon into it and dragged it back to the camp. The people were still sleeping. Later, they came out of their tents and igloos and shared that seal. That is when Angwatizwak and his people started to follow Jisuasi. Many years later, the missionaries came and told us the whole story about God and his son, as it is written in the great book. And we knew it was so. We are all, he is, I am, descendants of him. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. Like the High Arctic, Scotland's remote Outer Hebrides echo with tales of the supernatural. And like the Far North, this rocky, windswept armada seems an improbable place for God to visit. Yet the heavens have been rent over this ancient land with remarkable regularity. These visitations have been called revivals, but they are unlike anything most of us have ever experienced. History records gatherings of 9,000 people, but that's difficult to take in because there were only 12,000 people in the island. In 1949, the presence of God descended yet again, this time in the parish of Barvis. The refreshing was certainly needed, but it did not come easily. Religious pride and legalism had created deep divisions within the church. Some clergymen refused to believe that God could do a great work that did not begin with them. When the refreshing did come, they opposed it bitterly. There was such tremendous opposition from the largest denomination. Mary the Peckham was a teenager when the revival broke out, but she can still remember the spiritual coolness that preceded it. The spiritual temperature in the island before the revival was religious but uh, certainly not lively. It was a spiritual winter. Not everyone was ready to bundle up. Revival is some, something that uh, when you've experienced it, you always want to see it again. One revival era convert, a godly store clerk by the name of Donald John Smith, recalls how local intercessors went to work. People were praying all the time for this revival. They would be praying 
in the barns. You would hear them pray. Among the more fervent of these prayer warriors were two elderly sisters, one of them nearly blind, praying for revival several times a week, often late into the night. They were gripped by the promise of Isaiah 44. I will pour water on a thirsty land and streams upon the dry ground. One of them was housebound. She was in bed there. I used to read the Bible with them and pray with them. And you would feel the presence of the Lord. They knew their Lord. Challenged by the faith of these godly women, seven church leaders gathered in a nearby barn to pray. For months, they pled with God that he might kindle a greater appetite for his presence. That was the defining moment of the beginnings of the revival. It was 1949, in the middle of the year. As the elders continued their travail in the barn, they began to notice the lights in nearby crofts and farmhouses burning late into the night. Some never went out at all. The people's hunger for God had overtaken their desire for sleep. The elders realized their prayers had been answered. It was a community at prayer. Their faces would be tear-stained. There was such an expectancy, such a desire. And these prayers were traveling. They were painful praying. Such a longing that God would come. And uh, God answered. With nothing more to delay him, Jehovah drew near. Something very significant had happened the previous night. There was something quite strange, almost eerie, in the atmosphere in the house. We felt this power, and uh, afterwards, even the dishes were clattering. It was as if uh, the Lord came down with a mighty wind. The house shook with the power of prayer and the presence of the Lord. And people were afraid because this was a supernatural happening. The Shekinah glory of God descended upon the community a tangible, supernatural light hovering around many of the farmhouses. There was lights coming on houses. The glory of the Lord was just shining around about. They were all stunned. They couldn't say a word. What could they say? Be still and know that I am God. That's all we said. Around 4 o'clock in the morning, a crowd of several hundred people gathered outside the community police station. Many had traveled from neighboring villages, drawn by an incomprehensible power. Walking on the main road, they would be kind you to God to have mercy on them. They were lying down on the road for God to have mercy on them. It was as if we were suddenly in eternity. Eternal issues, eternal things were, were very, very real to us. A key figure in the unfolding revival was the Reverend Duncan Campbell, a fiery preacher with the United Free Church. He would storm up and down the pulpit. The perspiration would run down his face. Oh, my dear people, listen. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. The meeting halls were packed. Just as many unbelievers came, many uh, all over the island they were coming. The church was crowded to capacity. People sat in the windows. Just as many outside. Oh, yes. Just as many outside. You can make a community crusade conscious, the fiery revivalist would say, but only God can make a community God conscious. You see, the presence of God puts the flight program. Not an evangelist, not a special effort, not anything at all organized on the basis of human endeavor, but an awareness of God that grip Soon, the moving of God's Spirit was felt on other islands, including Harris, Bernera, and Tyree. But it was the revival on North Uist that Jean Blanchard remembers best. The year was 1957. There was an awareness of God's power working throughout the island. People were being saved every night. Lives were being transformed. We could only say, God came down. As news of the revival spread, several reporters showed up on the island around Christmas time. Upon arriving at their hotel, they were promptly escorted into the bar by the local proprietor. 
look. He said, all this alcohol is here. He said, the people are not coming. They're going to the meetings. The revival meetings had just spoiled their sales. Similar complaints were heard all over the islands. Lifestyle was changed, sorry, right. there's no doubt about that. The drinking houses of the village, they gradually disappeared one by one with the power of the revival. It affected the whole community. You couldn't be indifferent to what was happening. It was as if there was a canopy of an awareness of God over the whole island. There was a complete transformation. And the people in the world knew it. God had come. That was the answer. Revival is not only uh, biblical, but uh, believe in revival because it is historical. And God has done it in history. And because it is a communal, it changes communities. And it is practical, it changes people, it makes people new. And it is spiritual, it, it changes the whole spiritual tone, eliminating sin and, and crime. It, it's just logically the thing that is necessary. I hear the voice. Canada's eastern Arctic is divided into two primary domains, Nunavut, the country's newest self-governing territory, and Nunavik, an Inuit homeland in northern Quebec. Together, the region encompasses more than 2.7 million square kilometers. Remarkably, this vast and frigid landscape is inhabited by less than 30,000 natives. For hundreds of years, they traveled in clans. They had no collective voice. At these latitudes, the land is so cold that even trees refuse to grow. But it is the inner barrenness that does the real damage. For decades, the Inuit have struggled to find their identity. Robbed of any sense of place and purpose, many communities have spiraled toward the abyss. There was this great void. So many from that generation, they turned to alcohol. They lost their culture, so there was a lot of shame. For this town, it was like dark, dark, dark. That was like a nightmare. Uh, it was awful. It was very awful. I remember when people would die, we would go for mourning and mourning, you know, we would be sad because we have no hope. This is Kangatsujuak in northern Quebec, and we have about maybe... Um, around 500 people here. Annie Tertuluk has lived on Quebec's remote Ungava Peninsula since 1964. As Annie and her husband Mark know all too well, alcohol became a troublesome companion to many Inuit. We were one of the worst um, couple in town because we were young and we were drinking. When my heart uh, was beating fast after drinking, I could hear a uh, devil was waiting for me. I think the whole community was drinking at that time. I remember one time that uh, the whole community was drunk. When we receive our boots in the community all together, oh, you would hear people shouting there. I lost my brother because of alcohol. People shouting here. I lost a lot of friends. People fighting here. It was tearing up my life. It was bad. Oh my goodness, it was terrible. There were no laws. The frozen north was more like the wild west. No police. Life was dangerous. No rules in the community. Our community was really uh, sleepless people with all crimes that we had. Women and children had little protection. Oh, we had wife abuse, spousal assault. My husband, he, he beat me. Um, It's really hard that time. Like many Inuit women, 
Ayuka Pinguatuk has had to balance relationships with the tasks of Arctic survival. It has not been easy. I came a Christian when he was a uh, hunted, and he beat me for this. Sexual assaults were another consequence of the ever-present booze. Ayuka's daughter, Alice, remembers the fear that attached itself to every young woman. We had to protect ourselves from uh, sexual abuse. When I was young, I, I was raped. That guy was drunk, and after that, I was shamed. And I didn't like men, so I was awful. My life was awful. The wounds were deep and often reopened. Nobody really talked about abuse or the hurts of the heart, of the emotions that uh, I used to wish someone would talk to me, and nobody did. To cover their pain, many young people turned to drugs, alcohol, and heavy metal music. Others simply walked through the door of no return. I had a big mirror in my room, and I draw demons. I have a sister, she was 22 when she killed herself. She hung herself. On the Hudson Bay side of Arctic Quebec, the community of Povanatuk, or POV as the locals call it, has its own story to tell. It did not start well. By the summer of 1991, conditions in this isolated outpost were so grave that a CBC television crew was flown in to investigate. Their disturbing findings were aired that September on Canada's national news magazine, The Journal. Something is happening in Pavanatuk, a cluster of teenage suicides and self-inflicted wounds. The story, entitled Deadly Summer, ran for nearly 17 minutes. The eighth teenage suicide of the year, an appalling statistic. More than 20 times the Canadian average. Harry Tuluga, father of five. The first thing that comes to mind is, oh no, what, what can we do? Why? Why? I was here for the total horror that was felt and expressed at the time. And outside the arcade each morning, the local drugs of choice, solvents and lubricants. We had an enormous epidemic of suicide of youth. The death certificates boldly codify the toll of this awful year. It seemed like there was one suicide every month. Then came the realization that a lot of our children were experiencing sexual abuse every single family was touched. It was total darkness at the time. And the scene in POV was no different than any other northern community. Even the land turned its back on its inhabitants. In many areas of the eastern Arctic, caribou, fish, and berries, once abundant, began to disappear. For a people already living on the edge, the situation was perilous. And people were depressed, actually. We were sort of lost in a way. Looks like our community was cursed. While it appeared to some that God had abandoned Angwatizawak's descendants, in truth, God was the one seeking to reestablish the relationship. Just 60 years after God revealed his glory to Angwatizawak, he sent a second emissary to the Eastern Arctic. And this one had a name, Canon John Turner. He got this Bible when he was at college. The notes John Turner left in his Bible are revealing. Except a man forsake all, underline, that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Turner began his ministry among the Inuit in the late 1920s. In God's providence, his assignment took him to the very shores where Angwatizawak had led his people into a new covenant. Only two institutions preceded Turner's arrival in Pond Inlet, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police 
and the Hudson's Bay Company. But the tiny community would become an important spiritual beachhead. Joan Hobart was living in John Turner's hometown in England when she first met him. He was home on furlough and spoke at her church. His stories of the Arctic were riveting. As a young Bible student, Joan was in awe of this man of God. My friend said, I think, I think he's interested in you. I said, oh, no, he's a, he's a well-seasoned missionary, you know. But he was interested. He said, will you come and join life up there? And I said, yes. But the missions board said no. Arctic living was too harsh and no place for a woman. John went back without her. Joan would wait in faith. Three years passed without a single letter from the North. Then one day, a telegram. Permission granted. Bring ring, cake, and wedding dress. The trip was dangerous. The world was at war. German U-boats were patrolling the North Atlantic. The last leg of the two-month journey was aboard a supply steamer called the Nascope. The vessel stopped only once each year to offload food and mail. It was a long journey to the middle of nowhere, all based on a single telegram and a lot of faith. I was a bit nervous because I thought, now suppose he comes and doesn't really want me. And so I went downstairs into the saloon. I said, well, I think I'll marry the first one, the first man that comes aboard. So fortunately, Jack came in a little rowboat and came and found me. So I think it turned out all right. She and Jack, as she called him, were married that afternoon. They spent their honeymoon in an igloo they built together. As a newlywed, Joan learned how to use a coal stove, how to melt ice to make water, and how to make a home at 40 below. I had to learn how to cook seal. I wasn't good at it at the beginning. <laughs> oh, dear. Childbirth and medical care were strictly home style for the nearest hospital was too far. John Turner's love for the Inuit is clearly seen in his personal movies, and the love was reciprocated. Here was an Angelo who wore the ways of the North like a second skin. Local elders say he became more Inuit than the Inuit. He learned their language and translated the scriptures. He taught school using the Bible as his text. Most remarkable of all, were John Turner's epic missionary expeditions. Traveling by sledge and often alone, he scattered spiritual seed across a parish larger than most nations. A seven-month journey in the winter of 1938 to 39 covered an astonishing 3,000 miles. Turner's church in Pond Inlet was the first of its kind, a vibrant ministry that continues to the present day. Every day was special to her because that's the first time she had known about Bible and prayer. Lydia was a little girl when Canon John Turner taught her the gospel. Fifty years later, the precious truths still bubble up in song. Cornelius Newtigak grew up with memories of a coming glory. John used to say to us, there's a life after death. It is very beautiful, and it's called heaven. Turner was God's man in the Arctic, but the heaven he preached of was not so far away. The gun went off, and he fell back. Arriving home from a hunting trip, he saw a child struggling with a heavy load of ice. As he bent down to help, his shotgun slid off his shoulder and fired. It went up here into the back of his head. The effort to get Turner to a hospital made international headlines. Soldiers parachuted in with medicine to stabilize the badly wounded minister. As paralysis set in, Joan was John's nurse day and night, bathing him, turning him, giving injections. She had two toddlers and was nearly eight months pregnant. It would be weeks before the ice could support the landing of a rescue plane. The restless and hungry soldiers were now added to Joan's burden. I 
I went into Jack and I said, oh, I just can't do this anymore. I'm so done. And I began to cry, I think. And he said, well, they are my guests. We must do what we can for them. When John Turner had nothing left to give, he gave a little more. Weeping Inuit besieged the Turners as they set out for the frozen lake. Although John could barely speak, he led them in prayer. Shortly thereafter, Canon John Turner died in a Winnipeg hospital. Three weeks after his funeral, his third daughter was born. Joan named her Faith I found my dad's Bible the other day in my mum's bookshelf. and um, Although Faith just, never met her father, it was wonderful. he is no it's stranger. Just, I just was flipping through it, and I, I, I came across this that he'd written at the back. And I determined henceforth I would seek no appropriation but that of God. Did I ever start on a life of happiness and holiness? But from that day until now, I've been content to live alone with God. And I just saw in it what my father's heart was like to just, you know, go off to what God has spoken to him. John Turner died long before he went to the Arctic. He knew that unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. That was his vision. Joan has seen it too. I had a vision once of all the young people coming through the streets, singing hymns and things. In a vision, it will work one day. Yeah, it will come to pass. Like many in the Pond Inlet community, James Ariak sees himself as a spiritual descendant of Angutizawak and a spiritual disciple of John Turner. The planting of the word occurred into our parents. And our parents, through the planting of the seed, bore fruit. Back in February 1996, something happened. Throughout Pond Inlet, small groups of intercessors were pounding heaven with prayers for revival. Providing inspiration for this assault were two men with big hearts and worn out knees, Arctic evangelist Billy Arnacook and local pastor Moses Kayak. That's when the people were convicted and were drawn uh, to the Lord in a great numbers. And uh, they were so convicted that they, had to, they felt they had to clean their houses. The dirt paths leading to John Turner's old church were suddenly congested with desperate townspeople. Everyone, it seemed, wanted to get rid of their illicit drugs, pornography, and heavy metal music. It was coming in like a flood. We had a big can, garbage can, right in front of the altar every night. They kept filling it up and filling it up. Every night, they went to the dump and burned them up. After five nights, the town dump was full. As community leaders considered incinerating the remaining items, they received encouragement from an unlikely source, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. They had a bonfire uh, right about here where the iceberg is. The Mounties even provided logistical support. By God, they said, up. we can even God, provide gas. gas to burn up the junk. Nearly the entire community turned out for the burn. According to the RCMP, the value of illicit property destroyed during the revival was a staggering eighty to one hundred thousand dollars. It was a deep repentance. The Holy Spirit himself was speaking to the people. The whole community was completely transformed. The afterglow of this momentous occasion warmed hearts for months to come. But it also hinted at a fire yet unrealized. A fire so remarkable it would be talked about half a world away. February 28th. It happened in the middle of winter, February 28th, 1999. Believers had gathered for a week of revival meetings at the Anglican Church. Hungry for God and troubled by new reports of community drug use, they decided to add a special Sunday afternoon youth service. 
Among those leading the meeting were Pastor Moses Kayak and his ministerial colleagues Joshua and James Ariak, all great grandsons of the original lightkeeper, Angwatizawak. An invitation was offered for youth who felt they wanted to come closer to God. Worship leader Louis Ariak was praying over the youth that had gathered around the altar. I felt so close to God and he kept giving me this verse that says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Something s started to happen that uh, was out of our control. This uh, noise started coming. Yeah, it started softly, like you can barely hear it. A dual cassette deck used to record the service was still running off the soundboard. Right away, I wanted it stopped, but it kept getting louder, and, and I started to notice that people were kind of getting a little nervous. It was so strong, like, so strong. It was so loud that everything started to shake. Fire went right through me. It sounded like a jet. Things start to shake. I started to shake. I told myself, there's no jets in Pond and Light. After this extraordinary visitation, it was evident the moment still had power. Every time I thought about it, I, I was greatly humbled. Uh, thinking, thinking that uh, the Almighty God can visit us. When Pastor Moses Kayak first heard the low-pitched rumbling, he walked over to the church soundboard to adjust the settings. I tried this, not stop, tried this, no stop. When these efforts failed to correct the situation, he quickly turned down the master control. When this too failed, he shut the system off completely. Still, the sound and the recording continued. It shouldn't have been recorded. It's only by the miracle of God. He was completely humbled to the point where he wanted to continually come before God, kneel and ask for prayer and ask for the cleansing of the heart to become pure before him. This same Holy Spirit that graced Pond Inlet has also been visiting other communities in the Eastern Arctic. One of them, the tiny hamlet of Opaluk, is situated on Ungava Bay in northeastern Quebec. Established in 1978, the community quickly became known as a place of sorrows. There have been a lot of tragedy. This person suicide himself he was about 17 years old. There was another a girl, 19 years old, who also had suicide. What we did was we prayed for our community. We broke the curse in our community. The results were both immediate and tangible. I see that our community, it changed. I find since our prayer that time, we are set free. We're happy now. <laughs> School teacher Maggie Apatuk is the proverbial human dynamo, bearing witness of Christ's love at every opportunity. Since I'm a Christian, I always want to share my heart to the children. I always ask them, do you have a savior in your heart? The influence of the gospel in Opaluk's classrooms is pervasive and powerful. We start with the Lord's Prayer this morning. I thought they were telling me to do Sylvie Soucy is a secular contract teacher from southern Canada. I think most children here are pretty religious. According to Maggie, that may be an understatement. All of them are safe. 
all of them are born again. That's 40% of Opaluk's current population and its entire future. <laughs> Things are also on the upswing over in POV. Longtime resident and local pastor Elias Isolualuk is a happy witness to the change. In 1996, uh, this community was, was really revived, uh, really revived by the Lord. The whole community was really amazing. Once again, an important key was fervent, united prayer. Having a heart open to God, that was all it took. And then came the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the community. And the wailing, the wailing in the churches. The pain, the pain. The travail rose as incense before God and the heavens opened. We were seeing results, a lot of results, good results. Suicide has completely gone on the downtrend. In fact, crime at all levels has diminished. But we have an all-forgiving and almighty God, and families have been healing over these past six, seven years now. It's been wonderful to see the movement of God in our community. While it is tempting to stop and celebrate God's work in POV and Opaluk, the story does not end here. And it's wonderful to see how God is moving, not just in POV, in all communities. Since people started to get saved, it's a different story. My slate is clean because of Jesus. See, God is saving these people we never thought could be changed. I found him. He's a big guy. I really found him. He's a big guy. Hearts and relationships have been mended. I've seen men get up and publicly repent that I have abused my children and, and I've abused my wife. My husband, he's helped me right now. We are, he's really changed his life. Many people have been healed from those wounds, especially women. God is using them today. God is just changing communities. Jesus was the answer to all their problems. Whole communities, it's amazing. Uh, not every community in the Arctic is at the same level, but I don't think there's any community now where something is not happening. Everything, uh, it changed. It completely changed. It's spreading everywhere. The fire of the Lord is spreading. You can visit every community and you, then I can tell you the same story. Kuaktek, Kanutsukov, so. Kanutsukov and Kujuak. Aupaluk. Puvungtuk. And Rosaluk Bay. Clyde River. Arctic Bay. Panilet. Lake Harbor. Tessiuyak is starting. Cold Harbor. Kanutsualujuk is starting. Oh, what I see is beautiful. <laughs> The gospel has also begun to infiltrate the political arena. According to longtime Arctic missionary Roger Armbruster, God is raising up a new generation of native leaders that is not shy about declaring the lordship of Christ. This mace is made of a Norwell tusk. Now, this is the symbol of the authority of the Nunavut legislature that's brought into the legislature every time they meet to do official business. And it's written on paper inside this mace the prayer from the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Some mayors I know of open their council chambers for prayer meetings twice a week. They know that without God on this meeting, it's not gonna be good. So he's always included in everything. As the Bible says, when the righteous rules, the people rejoice. God has even touched the land itself. The land is, is starting to produce and become productive. 20 years ago, there was no caribou. And since that time, the, the caribous are coming back here. And Even fish in the lakes were starting to grow. Even the land is starting to produce some little plants. We are so blessed. A hope that once invaded the heart of a solitary seal hunter is now on display in churches, classrooms, and council chambers across the Eastern Arctic. It is a reminder 
that the love of God is not only deep and persistent, it is also purposeful. It's, isn't it like God to take a part of the earth that man would despise and say, well, what value is that frozen Arctic tundra? And God says, I'm going to use that part of the earth to glorify myself. I had a vision once of all the young people coming through the streets singing and praising the Lord. It will work one day. Yeah, it will come to pass. Listen, your watchmen lift up their voices. Together they shout for joy. When the Lord returns to Zion, they will see it with their own eyes. For I can hear that thunder in the distance like a train. Having observed God's willingness to transform discrete territories and cultures, only one question remains. Can this happen at a national level? Is there any evidence of God at work in a modern state, a sovereign nation? The East African nation of Uganda seems an unlikely place to look for answers. Racked with demonic fevers, this one-time Pearl of Africa has spent decades in a deep spiritual coma. Its very name has become synonymous with death. As the nursery of AIDS, and as Idi Amin's personal house of horrors. I think Uganda has been a country of pain, a country which has gone through one military coup to another. I know what it means to live in fear. Pastor John Melindi was a teenager <laughs> when the horror began. People have been killed in in, in thousands, massacres, whole villages being massacred. And sometimes you would not know exactly who is doing the killing. Those That's who listen really to John Melindi's vivid tales States. may squirm. His body lay there for two days. Or even weep. But, and the baby had pulled out the breast of a dead mother. We but they will the always the remember. We did not recognize what we were fighting against. Uganda's history, like that of many African nations, is filled with magic practices and secret rituals. Fetishes known as Mayembe were everywhere. And kings, even to the days of Idi Amin, are known to have offered human sacrifices. Africans are covenant people, if I may say. Much of what we have is covenanted to the devil. Our history tells us that our ancestors worship other gods other than the god of Abraham. For Uganda, the consequence of this idolatry has been a long season of fear and pain. What I knew about Idi Amin was a towering figure with the one throw around his weight and wanted his presence felt all over. Journalist Bart Kukuza grew up under the shadow of Uganda's infamous tyrant. Like many of his countrymen, he was optimistic when Amin's overthrow led to the return of former president Milton Obote. But they thought that maybe Obote would be better than Idi Amin, but it wasn't. There were powers of darkness behind these people that you're looking at, which were tearing apart this nation. In those days, it was common to find bodies lying by the roadside, and sometimes people would go to look over just to make sure, is it a person I know, a loved one? If not, they would just go on. And it wasn't just soldiers doing the killing. I was born to die. Pastor Jackson Sinyanga was just three months old when his mother threw him into the garbage. And uh, my grandma picked me up. Assuming he would die within a matter of days, an aunt agreed to take him in. But the boy lived, if only to revisit the pain. My father was murdered uh, in 79 during Idi Amin. And uh, at the funeral, that's when I first saw the picture or the face of my mother, never a letter, never a picture, no nothing. And I was already a teenager. Sadly, Jackson's father was part of a national epidemic. One day passed, two days without your loved one coming home. Then you know, maybe, maybe he's, a, he's dead. So the first place to go to would be Namave Forest. It was a forest of death. You could feel the spirit of death there, the heaviness of death. 
a mother traveling with an infant was asked for the baby's identity papers. And of course, the babies don't have identity papers. And the baby was snatched from her, thrown up into the air, and the soldier raised a knife, and the baby came and plunged on that knife. And by 1984, they began killing churchmen. They began killing pastors. Pastor Jotham Mutebi was in the middle of a sermon when Amin's soldiers burst into his church with guns blazing. As the bullets tore through the sanctuary, several elderly women rose and made their way to the altar. And when I saw them, I thought these people were so desperate and that they needed comfort. So I raised up my arms and uh, prayed over them. But I came to learn later that the reason they came, they wanted to die with me, their pastor. Instead, Pastor Mutebi and his parishioners were herded into hijacked trucks and taken to the dreaded Nakasero Center. Just a few uh, meters away from where we are was this Nakasero State Research Bureau. That was the torture chambers. The sadism and violence were unspeakable. They could put 60 people in a room that is just by uh, three by three meters and they are crammed in to the point that a person would die and stay upright, held up by the bodies of the other living ones. There were no investigations. Things would happen and that would be the end of it. It seemed the entire world had turned its back on the horrors in Uganda. Men have deserted us. Millions died. The bodies clogging the Owen Falls Dam and the shores of nearby Lake Victoria. We need to repent for whatever sins of our past. We defile our country. We are not any better than Cain. This preoccupation with killing took its toll on the nation's economy and infrastructure. The factories broke down. Essential com commodities became scarce and almost unknown. You couldn't get soap. You couldn't get anything. The city was dirty, and uh, most of your buildings were damaged. The morals of the people were so broken that you could not get a single thing done without having to pay for it. Just when it seemed things could not get any worse, they did. This time, the news was delivered by the World Health Organization. It was being predicted that by 1997, AIDS would be so bad in Uganda that one third of the population will have died. Dr. Patrobus Mufubenga is an accomplished physician serving with Uganda's National Institute of Health. During this time, everybody was desperate. Uh, all of us, we are losing our dear ones. Uganda has been crying to God, just like the voice was heard in Lama, women crying for their sons. The pain, the suffering, the sorrow, the fear, no one could console. They developed a saying before that said uh, that the God of Uganda had gone to sleep. In the middle of the night, there's one old man who stood up and pointed his cane to the pastors and said, where is this God you preach about? The God of power, the God who answers prayer. What has Uganda done to God? It looks like God hates us. From the depths of the grave, I called for help and you listened to my cry. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you. And they began praying day and night, day and night, day and night. It came through a lot of crying, a lot of waiting. There were times he had, they had to go into the swamps and stay in the water hidden in the papyrus reeds. So they would spend the whole day there, and in the night they would come out. And they would, they would then get together and pray. This was deep, groaning prayer. I am the man who has seen affliction. 
My eyes will flow unceasingly without relief until the Lord looks down from heaven and sees. I will choose to seek God until he answers prayer. If he's not going to answer, then I would rather die seeking him. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. And the presence of God would come down as the people cried out to God, and it would be manifest to the physical eye like a cloud, a heavy cloud of mist hanging over the people. When you walk into the meeting, you, you are immediately swallowed in. You know you're entering something that is tangible. Fifteen years ago, this was one of the most dangerous places in all of Uganda. This community was known as the Beirut of Kampala because under the regime of Milton Obote, undisciplined soldiers used to use the homes and shops in this area for target practice. Hopelessness hung over this community like a wet blanket. It was into this place that God led a young Ugandan evangelist by the name of Robert Kayanja. He was accompanied by six intercessors. This is our wailing wall where we used to pray. I Besides to contending here, with lawless so soldiers, Robert's team was also confronted by a powerful witch doctor named Musoki. I mean, there was kind of a fear that walked with this man. After being threatened with death, the intercessors cried out to God. Within days, it was Musoki who was dead. After the death of this uh, famous witch, Musoki, we begin to see the heavens open. Kayanja's tiny congregation became a vast multitude. The Miracle Center Cathedral now seats 10,000 people, and the fellowship has given birth to 600 daughter congregations. Uganda, which had been written off by many, many countries, whose economy had totally collapsed, which had no voice at all, and whose people were ashamed of being called Ugandans, began making a turn round and the healing process began. Not surprisingly, it is a change fueled by prayer. So churches began to pray in zones. It's like bees. You can hear bees through the night. Every community praying, every zone praying. And I felt like, you know what? The enemy must find another city, but not Kampala. Unity is another hallmark of the present revival. The work that God has been doing in this land cannot be claimed by any individual or any church or any ministry. Citywide pastors gatherings are common. God is calling us now together to pray together, to praise together. It is really happening that God is bringing churches together. To talk to each other, to appreciate one another. What I'm trying to do is to go with those people who love Jesus, who preach the word of God. Sometimes you find me in Pentecostal churches. I do go there. The body of Christ is coming together. I am overwhelmed. The revival we are involved in now is for everybody. And unity is not something we're praying for, but something we are thanking God for. Even the dire World Health Organization report on AIDS did not shake the believer's confidence in God. We have seen the AIDS virus healed, and the doctors go, Wow, I can't explain this, but there must be a God up there somewhere. I had chest pain, I had the skin rash. I started vomiting. These were terminal cases. I lost the appetite. I couldn't eat. People with full-blown AIDS. I grew very, very thin as a poor. After being prayed for, many sensed oh, God's heart. touch. That there is something changing that, at that very moment, that very night. The power of God came down, and I felt it. Not surprisingly, these self-proclaimed healings elicited serious skepticism from medical caregivers. Why have you bothered yourself to come here? Because your status and your appearance shows that you are a victim. But in time, 
this skepticism turned to amazement. My doctor looked at me. He was amazed. He said, hey, are you still living? I was checked. There's no AIDS. They read my name, Ruth Bidawa, HIV negative. And they told me you are HIV negative, nanoreactive. There's no virus in your body. Then the rest of the symptoms started to disappear one by one. God had healed me totally. It was a refrain heard thousands of times across Uganda. But as I talk to you right now, I have experienced over 372 AIDS patients being healed. Uganda has been recorded as one of the first countries to see a decline in HIV. We believe it's because of our prayer, and we believe it's because of the love and the grace of God. It is also because Uganda has promoted abstinence and faithfulness as their primary weapons against AIDS. I vowed before you that if you heal me, I'll tell all the people. I will not die, but live, and will proclaim what the Lord has done. The power of God has also been manifested in the political arena. I believe Uganda is in a new beginning politically. In divine timing, God brought leadership. God began to put people in place. God is working in this country. Paul Atiang has held nearly every post in Uganda's government, including prime minister. But the Lord has always been with me. But it's the Lord who makes character. Beatrice Bayenka is a member of parliament from the Hoima district. So I want to, to be more firm in everything that I do and so that the light may so shine. They expect us to reflect Christ. Stephen Unyo is the nation's deputy police commissioner. I'm one of those who believe that God must talk to me, especially in this type of job I am. On a number of occasions, Unyo has seen God quell violent riots in answer to prayer. And I believe, out of my personal experience, children of God, if we continue in prayer, there is nothing impossible. But I've taken my faith up to the governmental level. Cecilia Adam Ogwal is the fiery leader of Uganda's parliamentary opposition. I am an ambassador of Christ. And I'm not ashamed to testify that anywhere I go. As we saw the government changing and the spiritual realm being changed, we felt, you know what, the God of Uganda has not gone to sleep yet. The gospel has introduced new changes even in the structure of the government. Now we have a new ministry called the Ministry of Ethics and Integrity. We never used to have that. God put me in this position. God needed a tough person for a tough assignment. And when I was tussling with getting born again, I told him, I want you to get me hold of me like you did with Saul on the way to Damascus. And he did it. Miriam Matembe remembers the day she stood before the president and his cabinet to explain her portfolio. Her words were prophetic. Do you remember the story of the children of the Israelites in the slavery and how Moses led them from the promised land? Ah, here I am. I'm the Moses of Uganda. The Lord has appointed me here to lead Uganda from UNESCO conduct moral decadency, corruption to the right direction. As the source of the river that once carried a younger Moses to his destiny, Uganda is again on the highway to history. And the journey is nowhere more evident than in the government's aggressive plan to build ethics and integrity in public office. I knew that the battle is very hard and difficult, but the Lord is with me. Today there's a lot of corruption in Uganda, but if we look back to how it was 15 years ago, it's just incomparable. Judge Julia Sabutendi is a special prosecutor appointed by the president, a fervent Christian. Her corruption-free reputation has brought new energy and credibility to the campaign. What she has unearthed has shocked the whole nation, and people are trembling, big shots. The files are full to refresh our memory, talk to us. She is what she is because she's born again, because she has stood her ground. And to see that today people are coming back to this place of integrity is amazing. We have seen God do great things until crime rate drops 50%. Not surprisingly, this new attitude is impacting the national economy. While things are still tough, 
positive signs are everywhere. The economy, which was predicted to collapse, has not collapsed as such, but it has been among the three fastest growing economies in Africa. And Uganda's churches are growing even faster than her economy. And we went from seven people to 2,000 people in two weeks. Not bad for a young man who was once tossed onto a garbage heap. Today, it's amazing. We have five services on Sunday morning, and uh, we're averaging about 20,000 people. And today, I'll tell you, our church is not the only church that God's growing. And there is revival, immense, immense revival going on within our churches. Every day in Uganda, there is a new church starting up, or a ministry starting up. Once we have set ourselves free from the sin of our past, then we need to focus on the purpose of God. On New Year's Eve, 1999, Uganda joined the rest of the world in celebrating the arrival of a new millennium. But there was a special character to the Ugandan celebration. His is the invisible hand that has moved us along and shaped our destiny. Ten weeks earlier, First Lady Janet Museveni had invited several church leaders to a meeting. So when she came in, she told us she had a vision. As we enter the new millennium, can't we organize a time of thanksgiving to God for the way God has got us through this period? I mean, she had re requested that we dedicate the nation officially back to God. Good morning to all of you. And happy new year. So in the presence of the president and the first lady, we covenanted the nation to God for the next 1,000 years. And we renounce idolatry, witchcraft, and satanism in our land. The covenant, which included the signatures of the president and first lady, was remarkably explicit. We are conscious that we have put other gods before you and worship It read like a passage out of the Old Testament. Covenanting our nation, Uganda, to the purposes of God and to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Amen. Then the king called together all the people from the least to the greatest. The king stood by the pillar and renewed the covenant in the presence of the Lord. From beginning to end, and it was just God. Let shame cover my face, O oh Lord my God. Shame and reproach, Lord, cover my heart. Watching these fervent assemblies, one is confronted with a glorious irony. Dictators once tried to destroy the nation's faith by preventing people from entering church buildings. Instead, the edicts and padlocks served only to remind believers that the church has nothing to do with buildings. When Uganda's faith was taken outdoors, into football stadiums, banks, hotels, even parliamentary offices, it flourished. Jesus is standing on the right hand telling the Father, Father, I'm ready for Uganda. And Uganda that was, once used to be the pearl of Africa was now about ready to shine again. It's amazing for people who lived at that time to see what's happening now. Life has come. It seems there's, there's a new king reigning over the nation of Uganda. Uganda is ready for God as a nation. It's astounding. It really is a miracle. Nobody can deny it. It wouldn't have been possible if it hadn't been for the Lord. To those who would ask, why did God move so powerfully in these particular regions, the answer is simple. He was invited. 
And I think the spirit of revival works in a country. It, is, it must be invited. It must, people must desire to have that spirit. It's the kind of desire that deeply yearns to the, to the Lord. People are praying and they're seeking God as the realization that the only way out of this mess is God coming upon us and God cleaning up society and God making all things new. If my people... We must humble ourselves into the mighty hand of God first. If my people... We can only move the spirit by our prayer. There's no other way. Let there be prayer in every area of the land, in every town, in every village, in every church. If my people... Lord, we need to come. We can't do it on our own, but come to us, come visit us. If my people... There's a place to pray for a revival. There's prayer, there's tears, tears of repentance. Father, my God, we pray that you carry out this surgery in the hearts of the people, Lord. Our heart matters to God more than anything else. Remove the heart of stubbornness, the heart of unbelief. He is really attracted to pure hearts. And Father, give us the heart of flesh that loves you, Lord, my God. Then will I hear from heaven. God will listen to the prayers of his people, fervent prayers. He listen to them. He'll hear you, and you will know the faithfulness of God. I will forgive their sins. Since we got to know Jesus personally, God makes a big difference. Now we have hope. And I will heal their land. Miracles have been happening in this country, and we believe Uganda will never be the same again. Oh, God is so good. I have seen this community just transformed by the power of God, really. There's going to be a time when the whole world is going to experience nations coming to maturity, nations coming to the fullness of their purposes. That time is so near. Driver driving through the rush of a 